Khan, could you do us a great honor of naming this Intercity 225 locomotive Palace of Holyrood House? Accompanied by Intercity Director Dr John Priddo, British Rail Chairman Sir Bob Reid, and Transport Secretary Malcolm Rifkind, the Queen had travelled from King's Cross aboard a brand new Intercity 225 train. Loco number 91029, Queen Elizabeth II, had been named by Her Majesty before departure from London to inaugurate the full electrified service on the East Coast Main Line. I can remember the first local arriving, uh, 91001, outside on the back road, uh, and a very exciting time for all the depot. The depots function up to that point. We'd been running the 32 of the high-speed 125s, and therefore it was a big transition for us from diesel haul to electric. The first locos to enter service ran with HST sets, minus a power car. We, we had to convert um, the, um, one of the power cars on the HST for, for the simple reason that the locomotive had been delivered before the trailer cars, so we had to test the electric locomotive. Uh, but we needed a rake of vehicles to test it with, so we used um, effectively, we used a high-speed train with one of the power cars taken off, substitute the Class 91. The idea of the other diesel power car, the HST, was to provide auxiliary power uh, in the rake of vehicles because the Class 91 wasn't uh, was supplying it. Um, to that extent, all we needed to do was to have the engine idling to supply the auxiliary power. The problem with diesel engines idling is that they tend to have a build-up of, of fuel in the exhaust and more than one occasion they, they caught fire and the, the newly installed overhead line um, uh, or the engineers installing it didn't take too kindly to, to fires underneath it. So we decided to restore it into tractive power controlled remotely from the Class 91 and vice versa. So we ended up with, with a real sprinter of a train overpowered if you like but also with a get-home capability. The hybrid didn't last long, but while it did, it was enormous fun. Uh, with with 2,500 horsepower for traction on the back and 4,700 on the front, uh, you went up Holloway Bank like a dose of salt. So I'll never forget the first time uh, I actually tried a hybrid and you thought, good grief, this is something really hairy. There's no substitute for testing a train in, in service. You can do all the static and uh, private testing that you want, but frontline duty exposes all the general day-to-day -day operating risks. The locomotive is, is well capable of running at 140 mile an hour, and in fact I was part of the test team that ran at 162 miles an hour with five coaches from Grantham to Peterborough to set a new UK record. The real key issue was not one of maximum speed per se. The real challenge for designers of the Class 91 was, was simply this. It wasn't just f designed for passenger operation. It was designed for freight. It, was des it had to haul 600 tonnes. It had to haul um, uh, sleeper vehicles on the West Coast Main Line up Shap Fell. So, you know, its thermal rating was, was dictated by these other things, not just uh, maximum speed operating passenger trains. And there lies in the, the huge technical challenge. Today, um, you wouldn't see anybody trying to, and certainly not in this country, trying to make a workhorse be a racehorse and vice versa. The, the current servicing requirements of the 91 is an underframe and safety of the line every 10 days, every 10 working days, uh, a, a light exam at 60 days, and a further examination schedule at 120 days and that's taken roughly a thousand mile a day diagram as the optimum. The trains are worked hard uh, on the East Coast Main Line. They have to be, they have to sweat the assets and the, the uh, locomotives will probably do 250,000 miles a year. The Mark IV carriages uh, did have some ride problems. That, that happens on every new build. It's always a trade-off between uh, 
between being stiff for stability and, and soft for comfort, uh, rather like the difference between a Formula One car and, and a Rolls Royce, if I may use that analogy. The Mark III coaches were a hard act to follow, and the Mark IV coaches needed a series of modifications to optimize the ride quality, involving the primary damper systems and the lateral dampers that were fitted to the tight lock couplers. Um, I do believe now that the ride quality is very good. Compared with an HST in ride terms, I think we're going to be very hard pushed to match the ride quality of a Mark III. That really, they got it absolutely right back there in the 1970s. But if you give a, a, a 225, a well-maintained 225, as they always turn out at Banff Green, and well-maintained track, uh, you can have a very comfortable ride. And the odd thing is, it gets better the faster you go. I well remember that at 140, uh, it is absolutely superb ride. The coaches have between, uh, go as long as possible between service intervals and the, the bogies, which are the main uh, running parts obviously, um, have been extended from an original target of 750,000 to a million and we're now working to see what the possibility within safety, which is, which is paramount, to extend it to one and a quarter million miles. That's a, a lot of distance between uh, overhauls. And indeed, if you uh, look at the locomotive and the, and the fleet, they are doing 250,000 miles a year over the last 10 years, times 31 vehicles. You're talking here of 80, 85 million miles that those locomotives have done. Yes, they've had some reliability problems, but when you compare that with motor cars and how many miles a year that you do, we work these assets very hard on the ways. We found out lots of things about the, the locomotive, which subsequently were, were either, either designed and built in then, or they were changed subsequently um, f because we had a, a, two, a, a, a fleet of 10 and a fleet of 21 making up the total fleet. So we were able to build in the experience of that into some of the first batch of 10 and definitely into the second 21. Well, a number of modifications were carried out to the locos prior to trial running and during the trials. Um, a lot uh, orientated around noise levels within the locomotive. Uh, the loco was fitted with a large inductor on the roof, commonly known as a sausage, and uh, a number of other um, noise reducing uh, mods were carried out. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, there are some things that, that, uh, that I would change. Uh, they are more to do with interior fitments and features. Uh, for example, the st I think the standard class seats are too hard and, and, and less attractive than you would find on the equivalent of the predecessing train, so to that extent. But those are easy things to change. Uh, expensive, yes, but, but you can change them. They're designed to be, to be changed. But in the round, um, I, I, the, the product works and uh, uh, it's, it's been brought uh, on time and, uh, and a lot of revenue. It's been a huge success. It was uh, seen as, as, as a new generation of electric locomotive, a very high performance electric locomotive and uh, train to a very diffi difficult specification uh, and it has fully fulfilled all its uh, potential. It, it, it's a great train. I think Intercity were ecstatic uh, with the performance of the train and that was borne out by passenger growth during the first um, period of trial running uh, and subsequent introduction to service. To the extent that, that British Railways Board and the sector director, John Prideau, at the time, avoided an APT saga where the product never came to market, to that extent we can, we can tick that box and say the 225 project was a success. On top of that, it's been well perceived by the customers. It's had its problems, as any new product does, particularly one brought into, into the market at this time scale. We never set out with this project to make the, the, the most luxurious train in the world or the highest performing train in the world. What my job was, and those of my colleagues in it, was to, was to create a, uh, to deliver a product on time and to budget that worked, above all, that, that, that worked. And uh, to that extent, we did, I, the products had problems since, um, which I'm happy to say my present company has been, been involved with. But essentially the product worked. What of the future? The 
the HGR, the heavy general repair, due to commence in June of this year, is designed to take the loco through for the rest of its life and will involve some significant upgrades in equipment and software. Uh, we're going to rationalise the gearboxes and uh, a number of the relays and contactors are being removed and replaced with solid state devices. Privatisation in the UK has effectively signed the death knell of the multi-purpose, all singing, dancing uh, locomotive. It, it really isn't relevant. What we need now is more standardisation of equipment, for sure. That's good for the manufacturers. We need volume, need volume in order to spend money on design and research uh, so that we get a more dependable product because at the end of the day the passengers not really interested whether it's got an AC or a DC traction motor. It'll be horses for courses in the future and for that reason I think the the electric multiple or diesel multiple unit uh, is going to be the answer. From a service point of view I actually believe that the uh, multiple units are a lot easier to service than locomotives and, and one of our difficulties is in keep treating both the locomotive and the stock separate units. I shouldn't be surprised to see the Class 91 locomotives still running in 2025 after their, uh, particularly after their heavy general repair. Following the refurbishment of the fleet uh, I do believe that it will run for at least the next 20 years in service. Well in the books of the rolling stock companies who own it uh, the Intercity 225 fleet is down at a 30-year life. Uh, I fully expect them to stay in service for that long and I think they'll be in frontline service in 2020. I only hope I'm around to see it. <laughs>